I want to underscore something here. I'm struck by the fact that uh, actually, uh, you know, among the four of you, there's actually a fair bit of agreement about what we see as an attractive moral outcome over the very long term. I think that all of you agree that, you know, being seen as an individual uh, has value. But one thing I detected uh, both in Glenn and Bob's remarks is this idea that there are certain kinds of sacrifices that are appropriate to make in the name of solidarity. That is, you know, one version of your um, sensibility, Camille, and, and this will be ungenerous, but I'm you know, curious to hear your reaction, but also Glenn's, is that, you know, essentially what you're saying is that we live in a much freer society now. We live in a society in which one can have more agency and freedom of action and that it is a moral imperative to claim that and to claim that individualism to derace oneself. But another view is that that poses a kind of collective action problem in which you have people who have the ability to capitalize on those opportunities uh, through the kind of attenuation of those rigid racial ties. And then what you see is the defection of people like you from this kind of larger collective public good of acting on behalf of a racial group that has been stigmatized and excluded. I wonder if that makes sense to you, what your reaction to that is. And I also want to hear from Glenn, if that sounds roughly right to him, that part of what we're saying is that, yes, it's a good and healthy aspiration to be free um, of those group obligations, but those group obligations really bite right now. And that uh, there is a responsibility for those who Can have ask, that role. How, how do they bite? Well, well I, I'm I'm gonna right. just want to throw out the idea to <laughs> well, to no, but I mean, I mean, that's a that's a, it seems to me a key point. You you bite? Do you mean racism? That people are still being victimized by racism? I, I'm just trying to really get a. Well, I'm, I, of, I, I, I'm trying to kind of advance what I take to be part of Glenn's view, so maybe he would be – Well, the collective action problem, just very straightforwardly, you have goals toward which you would like to mobilize people to achieve those goals. Each one individually might not have a, the interest to make the sacrifices if they only thought of it in their own terms. But if they see themselves as part of a collective – and I gave the example of nationalism. You have a country. You have people – asked to sacrifice, to pay taxes, to fight and die if it comes to that. And underneath that is a sense of identity. It's a sense of, in this case, Americanness, to which they feel a certain degree of obligation or responsibility. It's just what an analogy. What do you analogy. do when racism is what, gone? What I'm saying is the black church, I give that as a concrete example, is an institution. It has a history. It has a narrative. It has a sense of self-understanding, and it gives meaning to people's lives. It's but not it'll only never, it, it'll never be the same, Glenn. From okay, you, you, freedom. You, we were, we're in freedom now. The black church was formed when we were in naked oppression. Today we're we're in freedom. Racism is not there. You can worship any way you want. Uh, we're so free we don't know what to do with it. Uh, no, we're in agreement about the, that. We're in agreement about that, Shelby. But I'm, I, thinking, I'm a I'm a I'm a jazz fan. I love. I love the music, follow it way too much because uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's to me a, a rare, magnificent creation that does come out of black, the black experience. But that experience doesn't exist anymore. Racism is simply not, not a problem. It doesn't deserve the whole, a cultural response. Well, Shelby, those are two different I think things. What I, I, what, what I find disturbing is that the left, both uh, the elite left, and I are using race. Mm -hmm. Yes, they to are. To the you disadvantage totally of poor people, and they are dying as a consequence of their misuse of it. Yes, so absolutely. It's, it's, absolutely. But if you're not going to confront that reality with some idealized version of post-racism and just say, well, we're just, it doesn't exist anymore, so they'll, they'll, we'll just act like it doesn't exist. Well, no, I, I you've got to take action, I think, in those places to confront those who are misusing race. And the way we do it is to gather groups who are suffering the problems, like the mothers who lost children to homicide, to stand up to the black left and say, we are against defund the police. And we, uh, and so it, it, is, it, is, it is important to have those suffering the problem as well, why the symbols would you, why of that would pushback. You, why would you exclude whites? From the letter of protest, because it doesn't letter. have the same power when black. In other words, you when, when someone derives their moral authority by saying they represent you, 
when you stand up yourself and say they don't represent me, that undermines the moral authority. But if I go in and say, oh, I have to have a white person on my arm to walk in to claim it. No, I mean, it's a strategic move, Shelby. It's not a but ideological you, 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 you block. Saying, it's a strategic you, move. You're saying you have to have a black person, only black people on your arm. No, 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 no. What he's saying, you're, what he's you're saying is on they, race. they don't speak on for race. black people. The, the message that we want to give is those blacks who have appropriated race on behalf of race card playing nonsense don't speak for black people. Exactly. Can, so can so in order to people? say that, there are two things you could do. One of them is I'm black and they don't speak for me. The other is blackness is a fiction. Nobody speaks for black people. We opted for That's the right. former mm -hmm. move. Yeah, and, and again, I well, you, well I, identity. I, let me. Let me no, it's, it's it's perfectly fine. I'm happy to defer to you. No, no, please let me. <laughs> let me. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. That's the that that's the decision that's being made. I just think that it's it's impossible to to not. Well, no, it's not impossible. It's imperative that we take a look at what the costs might be, and to the extent we are refurbishing, sustaining notions of racial difference, a, a notion of of there even being any authority whatsoever or respectability in asserting that you are speaking on behalf of a particular group of people, that there is a particular opinion that is held by all people that look a particular way, then that is something that we ought to be wary of. And, and I, I would go a step sure. further and say, it, you're absolutely right, Bob. It is imperative that you are pushing back against you know, dangerous currents in our culture and that you're confronting people who insist on and kind of framing things with respect to race in order to derive some sort of cultural or political power. At this point, we can't even talk about student loans without invoking race and talking about it because it's, it's a powerful tool. That said, the best way to actually undermine that is to acknowledge that this tactic is being deployed and two, not to give even the appearance that this is a respectable way to conduct business, to focus, I think, very narrowly and specifically on the defects of the policies that are being proposed and to provide affirmative solutions, like better alternative approaches. And I, I think you've mentioned a few times, um, Glenn, this, the, the black church and other kind of valuable institutions that exist that, that have some sort of a racial context. I'm, I'm not interested in... Like obliterating the black church. I'm not interested in, in telling people that they shouldn't think about their church as a black church. But I do think a lot about the, a, a, young, a young pastor who's planting a church today, a brand new church, who insists on it being kind of affirmatively, unapologetically black. And a lot of things go along with that. And that is something that happens today. And most of those people are buying into a set of kind of ideological priors that are wildly inconsistent, I think, with progress and certainly wildly inconsistent with an individualist perspective of of how to think about free people operating in a free society. There's a real sense in which our embrace of this concept, whatever the advantages we imagine we're deriving from it, are an obstacle to some of the broader philosophical projects that we might want to engage in. And I think at a minimum it's it's worth contemplating, you know, we had the March on Washington, we had King give his I have a dream speech and it was it was and is beautiful and powerful. But at the same time, it's imperative to note that, no, they're not white girls and black girls. They're just girls. And that is a that is a that's a step in a particular direction. There's a, you know, a particular line that's being drawn in the sand there. And I think well, it's, that, that, it's that worthwhile. That is a, white, a whitewashing of history. Look, look. I don't, they, I don't they, think that's a, I'm not asking church. us to change our perspective on what happened historically. I'm talking about the way forward. Okay. You know, the reason, the reason why the, the left, that we are counterculture now, is because our, our, uh, our uh, inability to communicate important values and convince people that those values are important. And that is uh, what the left does. And I think Ralph Nader is a perfect example of how you market ideas and principles. When he comes before the Congress to convince the Congress that we need to regulate automobiles, he comes with a weeping parents of a 16 year old who lo was lost in a Pinto, a wrinkled fender of a Pinto with blood on it. And then he says, this is the consequence of that policy. Now, let me tell you what changes have to be made. By contrast, conservatives will come with four white guys with blue suits, with ties, with charts, with data. Who wins that fight? 
And so I think it's important that you have to have the right symbols. I choose to take the people suffering the problem who lost children. And when they say that we must stop talking about white people for a year and address the enemy within, that is that has much more power than if I were to come with some interracial group uh, armed with uh, uh, some niceties of post-racialism. I, I just want to get a word in here because so much is flying by. I think you guys are overreacting. I think you're basically right. And I think the long run that you envision and I envision are very similar long runs. Uh, it's just that I think that the abolitionist move, the principled rejection of the category race on behalf of an ideal is, as Bob has said, strategically surrendering too much. And I also think it's a little bit ahistorical. I, I just want it for a moment. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, I'm talking about Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, these guys at the end of the 18th century in Philadelphia, when slavery was still running strong, founded an institution that is now a global institution of black people striving to do exactly with their freedom what Shelby would have them do, determine their own fates, take responsibility for their lives and for the raising of their children and so forth and so on, nested within a certain narrative, a certain sense of our, quote unquote, our history. Now, I have many ancestors and some of them are European. Uh, uh, 23andMe tells me some of my ancestors are European. But the account I give of from whence I have come is deeply nested within this African-American history. And all I'm saying is it's not yet time to throw that over, even as we understand the deeper philosophical truth of transracial humanism as the goal toward which we should all be striving. Well, you're, you're fighting a straw man. We, we would never throw it over. Uh, how could you, why would you want to? I would, I've been studying black American culture all my life. I love, uh, it is, it, that'd be a word stronger than identification. Uh, it, it is, it has made me who I am and for, I'm grateful for it. And yet the, the, the world works by evolution. It evolved. It, it transforms. We won our fight, long fight against racism, for example, in 1964 when the Civil Rights Bill was passed. What is that, 60, 70 years ago? We won. It wasn't manifest in reality yet entirely, but increasingly we have, we have just become, you know, more and more and more and more free. Uh, and at this point, it seems to me we are we are balking in the face of freedom we are intimidated by what it asks of us and it's uh, some of that is that we're, we're going to be sort of ripped away from that narrative that you you mentioned um and we and we're gonna we're gonna have to invent ourselves as free men and women and we're gonna have to change what it means to be black and, and I would, I would. It doesn't just mean. It doesn't just mean responding to racism and hatred. That's it. Did it at one time, but it, today, we black people, our biggest problem is modernity, the modern world. We're unprepared to live in it, to thrive in it. That's our problem. And maybe there's a little racism in there somewhere, but the real problem is. California last year, uh, black uh, black kids who graduated from high school read at an eighth grade level. That's the problem. 